Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. It's called the Foundation for the Future. It's funded by the State Department, but what exactly is it? And why is it so blinking hard to get information about this taxpayer-financed entity? With me to discuss this mysterious foundation is Shelley Walden, International Program Associate at the Government Accountability Project, and Patrice McDermott, Director of OpenTheGovernment.org. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank Hi. you. Shelley, let's start with you. So sure. what is the Foundation for the Future? Well, the Foundation for the Future was established to promote democracy and reform in the broader Middle East and Northern Africa region. That's like the clinical, technical definition. Um, but after researching it, I think what it really was was a public relations campaign by the Bush administration to retroactively justify the Iraq war. The reason I say that is because after we invaded Iraq, there were no weapons of mass destruction. So the Bush administration had to come up with another justification for us being there. And one of the things they really clung to was this democracy dominoes theory. This theory that if you promoted democracy in Iraq, it would spread throughout the Middle East. Now, experts in the State Department told them that theory was not viable, it was not going to work, but the Bush administration clung to it anyway. So in around 2004, 2005, they started thinking, how can we get this vehicle to promote democracy through the Middle East, um, to really make it seem like we're interested in democracy? So they created the Foundation for the Future. Now, in the documents we looked at, it was first mentioned by Elizabeth Cheney, the daughter of Vice President Dick Cheney, in 2005. Well, what and, was she doing? At yeah, the time? at that time she was at the State Department. She was high up in the State Department. She was working on Middle East affairs. Um, and she first mentioned this foundation. So we think it might have been her idea or maybe the vice president's idea and he channeled it through her. Um, and one of the first things she said about the foundation was that she wanted to bring in someone from the World Bank to work on it. Now this was sort of a weird thing to say because the World Bank is an international organization. It's not really connected with the State Department. There's no good reason to bring in a World Bank official to work on this project. And so who did they bring in to do this? They brought in Shaha Riza. And Shaha Riza. Riza, okay. yes. And, and who Sha is that? She was the girlfriend of Paul Wolfowitz. And Paul Wolfowitz was, he's credited as the Iraq War architect. He was the second in command at the Defense Department. For those of you who have seen Fahrenheit 9-11, he was the guy who uh, had a comb and spit on it and then brushed his <laughs> hair. Um, and he went to work for the World Bank as president in 2005. He was appointed by? He was appointed, well, technically he was appointed by the Board of Governors, but the World Bank president in practice is uh, appointed by the U.S. president, but in theory, he's not really <coughs> supposed to be. Um, so he became the World Bank president, and Shah Hariza was working at the World Bank at the time as a communications officer. Uh, she was also a gender specialist and had expertise in the Middle East as well. Is she well. an American? She's not. She's a British national. Mm -hmm. um, so she was working at the State Department, and because of conflict of interest rules, she had to be moved. <coughs> So rather than move her to a more independent branch of the World Bank or someplace else, they seconded her to the State Department, which was very unusual. I mean, she's not a U.S. citizen. It wasn't clear why they came up with this arrangement. Um, she was um, transferred to the State Department, where she worked in an unregulated, unsupervised position possibly in violation of U.S. tax law, U.S. visa law. She didn't appear to have a national security clearance. Um, so it was, it was a little bit of a strange arrangement. And what was also strange is while she was in this position, she was making more money than Condoleezza Rice, Who the Secretary then? of State. So she's making much $7,000 a year more than the Secretary of you, State. You didn't happen to bring along a job application for this? So I <laughs> no, it right I mean, I, I wish I had. That'd be a wonderful job, because um, <laughs> it's not clear what she was doing. I mean, for all we know, she wasn't doing anything. Well, what kind of budget did this organization have pledged at the beginning? Sure, um, and I should mention, actually, before we get into that, that 
how GAP got involved in this is Shah Riza's payroll records were leaked to us in 2007. Um, and those records made it clear that she received a series of raises in violation of bank rules. So we verified that information, we disclosed it, and that eventually led to the resignation of Paul Wolfowitz as president of the World Bank. And there were a series of other scandals as well, but this is the one that really stuck. So we became interested in what is the foundation for the future? What is it doing? Why was Shahid Riza working at this nebulous organization? We filed a Freedom of Information Act request. It took more than a year and a half for us to get the first batch of documents. Um, by that point, people weren't really as interested in what this foundation was anymore. Um, so we got the documents, and one of the things we did look at was the budget. Um, well, that we wanted to look at was the budget. We didn't get the budget, mm -hmm. but we wanted to look at it. Um, Liz Cheney, when she first mentioned the foundation, said she wanted it to have a $60 million budget. Now, when she actually started lobbying governments, she wasn't able to get that. She, Condoleezza Rice, and also Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, and Shaha Riza um, lobbied to get foreign governments to support this because they wanted it to be a multilateral initiative. It was important that it wasn't just a Bush administration initiative because then it, it was the clearly, coalition of the willing. Yeah, yeah. It, it was supposed to be a coalition of the willing, exactly. And if it was just the Bush administration, it really doesn't help this PR campaign very much. But when they went to foreign governments, foreign governments were not receptive to this idea. Unfortunately, we, GAP, don't know why, because when we got the documents, they were redacted when foreign governments expressed concerns. So it would say things like, the British government has misgivings about the foundation for the future, which include, and then there'd be a black marker, and you would have no idea what those misgivings were. But it was clear that um, foreign governments did not support the foundation, probably mainly because Liz Cheney was involved, so it's a little bit you know, hypocritical to have the daughter of the vice president coming and promoting a democracy organization when she herself is partly in her position, probably because of nepotism. So, so how <laughs> big a budget? How big a budget? Oh, I'm sorry, getting yeah. back to that question. Yeah. So <laughs> she wanted 60 million. Um, that didn't happen. So they went to the U.S. government, started lobbying the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Condoleezza Rice lobbied pretty heavily. Um, a board member, Sandra Day O'Connor, who was recruited by Condoleezza Rice. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Yes, former justice. Um, she was former Supreme Court justice. She lobbied for this um, and successfully got the law changed three times to be more favorable to the foundation for the future. And ultimately, the U.S. Pax taxpayer dollars went to this foundation, 22 million of dollars of U.S. money went to this foundation. Out of now, how much, to how big a total budget? Sorry, I'm getting into that because um, it's a little more complicated than it seems. Um, so the 22 million was supposed to be matched as a condition of it being given, um, but and it, it was required by law to be matched in order for the U.S. to give it. So the State Department said that 22 million dollars had been committed by other governments. Turns out that wasn't true. Um, we can't tell from the documents if they were outright lying or if they something, you know, wires got crossed. But they only only six million dollars came in from other foreign governments. So they said twenty two million was going to come in. We looked at the Foundation for the Future's financial records with the IRS, and only six million came in. So they had a budget of twenty eight million, almost eighty percent of which came from the U.S. government. So how easy was it for you to research this? This, this these were FOIAs and, and efforts that lasted almost three yeah. years. Yeah, well, I should say it was very difficult. I mean, originally we received more than 200 documents, so it was very time intensive to go through all those documents. But when we were looking through them, something that became really quickly apparent was that um, the juicy stuff, the numbers, the budget, the financial documents were all missing. So we're, we looked at it and we're like, where's the beef? Like all the good stuff has been hidden from us. And not only has it been hidden, but they haven't listed it as withheld. Because we knew that we weren't getting 50 documents. We knew that 80 documents were redacted. But we, the financial documents were not listed as withheld. So we went back to them and we said, clearly there are financial documents. They were required to be financial documents in this situation. We saw references to them. Why didn't we get them? We ended up going back and forth with the State Department on this for quite a while, which led to some of the delay. Um, 
And finally, we were able to get some of the documents, some of the financial reports. And what was really interesting to me was all these financial reports said is how much was spent in a certain amount of time. So it said uh, $200,000 was spent in this two months. But they didn't tell you what it was spent on, hmm. which to us was not helpful at all. I mean, we still don't know what money went to Shaha Riz's travel. I mean, we know her salary was paid by the World Bank, but we don't know what else this money really went to, especially in the early days when there wasn't much of a staff. Um, and, and they weren't making grants in the early days, but there was still quite a bit of money going to the foundation at that time. So it, it was difficult. It was very frustrating for us. Um, it was also frustrating other issues that we ran into with the FOIA process, including the overclassification of documents and the retroactive um, uh, classification right. of documents. Because we had, for example, a document that was titled Swiss Concerns About the Foundation for the Future. And that was retroactively classified, and it was also um, denied in full for national security right. reasons. And when you say retroactively and classified, you mean that it wasn't classified it, at it the time? It wasn't classified originally. And, and then we, they went back and did it yeah, after they went, the fact. Yeah, they went back and did it after the fact. And it, it was very confusing to us what national security risk do, does a nonprofit, nonprofit foundation pose? You know, we couldn't understand. That's why it's a secret. You yeah, don't we, know. we couldn't <laughs> understand why it was a secret. And yeah, there's a legitimate reason that this foundation, which was presented to the outside world as a multilateral, open government democracy foundation, was so secretive. But I, I can't think of a good reason for that. Uh, Patrice, this was an overwhelmingly U.S. funded um, right. foundation. Of eight, almost 80% of the funding wow. came from the United States. So its records are supposed to be open, aren't they, under the Freedom of Information Act? I would think so, although, you know, there's also the example of the Smithsonian Institution, which is largely funded by the federal government with congressional, uh, congressionally appropriated money, but also gets money from other sources. And they've decided to voluntarily disclose some information, but they're not required to. So I would, it, we would actually need to see whether it is considered an agency under the um, Freedom of Information Act and under the Administrative Procedures Act to, for, to know for certain if whether they fully came, on, right, yeah. came under FOIA. Yeah. But it isn't funding enough of a nexus to uh, subject No, one? apparently not. I mean, I would have said yes before we went through this thing a couple years ago with the Smithsonian Institution. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I think that that's not necessarily true. And um, again, you would have to go look at if they're defined as an agency. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's only on a voluntary basis. So. Well, you've been looking a lot at freedom of information under the Obama administration mm -hmm. as compared to the Bush right. administration. Right. We're, uh, we're now a few years uh, into right. the Obama administration. How is the administration doing on that front? I think it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and uh, a colleague organization crew has done a FOIA at midterm survey with the agencies. Um, I think their intent is good mm -hmm. and I think they are beginning to make very slow inroads but I think but wasn't there a presumption laid out at the right. very beginning of right. the administration that everything would be is, open. is unless open it's unless we clearly have a good reason right not unless to. there's and we very, have to make right. a finding to that right effect. right so what's and, happened with that well I think what I was about to say was they have discovered much to their surprise, that um, you could make declarations and it will affect some agencies and it will affect some sorts of releases, but it takes a very, very long time to turn around what was for eight years a, um, a professional group, the FOIA officers, who were, you know, operating sometimes unwillingly, but operating under a non-disclosure uh, policy under you, the Freedom of Information Act. What do you mean a non-disclosure policy? Under the Ashcroft Memorandum, Ashcroft was the first attorney general under uh, the Bush administration. What he, they essentially said, or what the attorney general essentially said to the agencies was, if you can find any 
legitimate reason, any legal basis for withholding information, do it and we'll defend you in court. Now what Holder said, He's going, the new attorney general. The new attorney general, yes, um, Eric Holder. Going more back to Janet Reno, who was attorney general under Clinton administration, said, unless you have a really clear understanding that there would be a harm to the country or a harm to the effective operation of the agency, um, you're supposed to disclose it. Now, there's some things that can be mandated that have to be withheld. Classified information is one. And I know from my past experience when I worked at the National Archives in the, what was the um, Carter Library at that point, that anything said by a foreign government is considered classified, unfortunately. So that's probably the, not very good, but the explanation for that. But so, yes, they, the rhetoric is wonderful. Um, the, in terms of actual litigation, my colleagues who do litigation tell me that they don't see much difference um, in terms of the you back. Mean people that are trying to get who access actually, yes. to government information and they sue the government. Sue the to get government, the exactly. Yeah. So if, if GAP had gone to court. Which we did. Which you did. Say. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wondered why you didn't. <laughs> we did. Um, they're not seeing an enormous difference in the arguments that are being made by the administration. And we've tried to get the current Department of Justice to tell us what cases, what requests from the agencies to defend them in cases they've turned down. Mm -hmm. They won't tell us that. We think that would be a really good indicator of how serious they are about not defending agencies when they in, are improperly um, withholding information, but they won't, they won't tell us that. U.S. government's vast though, and some mm -hmm. agencies, are some agencies more forthcoming than Absolutely. other agencies? Absolutely. So talk about that. We have found, or my colleagues really have found over the years that some agencies have a culture that is about openness. Um, and other agencies, it's really not going to matter what the Attorney General says to them or what the President says to them. Their agency culture is, this information is my information and you can't have it. Interestingly, one of the best in terms of FOIA releases, not that people get everything, but is the Department of Defense. And um, I think that that's probably because they take orders. They understand that when they're, they have a clear policy to do something, they implement it. Mm -hmm. um, other agencies, and I'm not sure about State Department, I think they don't have a really good reputation in this area. Um, it varies, but, but it really is an agency culture. And I think that's part of what the administration has not understood, is that you really have to change the culture of government. And you can't change it just at the top. You, you can't have just your um, secretaries of agriculture or the secretary of state mouthing these words if they aren't really going to Unless you have a strong well, chain of command exactly. structure, right? Really have to work to implement it. Rather than an ingrained bureaucracy where exactly. there are lots of turf, right. um, feudal fiefdoms, yes. as it were. Yeah, within the and agency. I'm sure that's part of the State Department. The other thing is, in fairness, a lot of the agencies don't have the resources that they need. Um, FOIA professionals, unlike a lot of other people in the government, don't have a career path. So it's very hard to get promotions in that field. You have to immediately go to being a manager, which some people don't want to do. And there's not a good reward incentives for releasing information. There are disincentives. I mean, the saying in Washington is you never want to release anything that's going to show up in the New York Times or the front page or the federal page, or we used to call it anyway, the federal page of the Washington Post. You can get in trouble for disclosing something. You don't generally get in trouble for withholding it. And you know, even when they're taken to court, it's not the agency that bears that cost. The Department of uh, Justice is the ones that defend it, but it's us, it's we the taxpayers who pay to uh, defend the agencies in their withholding of information. So there's, there's no real cost to the agencies not to withhold it. And that's something that I think 
this administration is slowly and painfully uh, beginning to understand. There have been some reforms, though, to mm -hmm. FOIA, right? So, uh, and limiting of exemptions, like for security, SEC, right? Yes, yeah. And one of the areas, um, and that, that has not so much come from the administration, because actually it has been administration agencies that have been asking for what are called B3 exemptions to the FOIA. FOIA has nine exemptions. The third exemption is by other statute. And so you get language in, in other statutes that says, notwithstanding any provisions of the Freedom of Information Act, this information can be withheld. It can be withheld from the public, Congress, the courts, you know, they, they'll try everything. And, you know, there's always a plethora of those. And under the new uh, financial reform bill, the Dodd-Frank bill, the SEC tried to get language that would allow them to basically uh, withhold from the public information about their investigations and audits. And their argument, and it's the common agency argument, is that, well, you know, these regulated entities are not going to give us this information unless we know, they know that we'll protect it. SEC, for instance, has subpoena power. I mean, they can go get this information. But there is a, an agency um, attitude that they have to be collegial <laughs> with these entities and we understand that when there's an ongoing investigation certainly you don't release that information sure. but once the investigation is closed one way or the other or if they never do an investigation well, this is supposed to be public information right right, right. And, and the public has a right to know if the give the government what they're doing or if they've chosen to do nothing mm -hmm. which is unfortunately over the last number of years been much more common so and the reality is that the other, I mean, the other exemptions in the Freedom of Information Act, there's exemptions for law enforcement, there's information in ongoing investigations, there's an exemption before for uh, business, confidential business information. There's been no problem government-wide in protecting information about ongoing investigations. And what our community has argued is there's no reason to treat it differently agency by agency. The law works. It works really well. We have, you know, 40 years of litigation and court cases that, that make it clear where the rules are, what the rules are, where the boundaries are. So, um, Well, let me ask you, because mm -hmm. we're running out of time, uh, uh, about some reform measures you would recommend, and, and I want to swing it back to what we were talking with Shelley right. Walden about. Um, doesn't it make sense that in a situation where the United States government, if it were conducting the activity directly mm -hmm. by it itself, would be subject to freedom of information right. if it creates funds, the creation of a, a nominally independent entity right. like the Foundation for the Future, shouldn't that entity also be subject to the Freedom of Information Act? I would say yes. But, but again, it depends on, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> um, but I, I really do think it goes back to what the constitution, as it were, of that uh, entity is. Um, I would certainly argue that to the extent that it receives any taxpayer dollars, that the public has a right to know where that money is going and how it is being spent. And, you know, that is a way in which this administration has really been trying to move government. And the Congress has, too. In the last reform to the Freedom of Information Act, they made it very clear that it extends to contractors, for instance, so that agencies can't ship their records over to a contractor and then say, oh, you know, we, we don't have to comply with FOIA because they're over there and, and they're not subject to FOIA. So to the extent that maybe this entity, this foundation, Could be were a contractor, as right, a, a contractor. contractor. Yeah. But certainly, I do think that needs to be clarified. And like I said, I think the administration, you know, with the stuff, the Recovery Act money, they set up this whole system for tracking that all the way down to, you know, probably not the worker on the, manning the shovel, but um, to allow the public to know where their taxpayer dollars are going. And, and so I think that is a way that in general, this administration, and in, way that in general, the government is going. I, I think 
you know, it's the Googleization of government in some ways. The public expects to be able to look stuff up and to know what's going on. And why not? And why not, exactly. Well, many thanks to Patrice Thank McDermott of OpenTheGovernment.org and Shelley Walden of GAP for explaining FOIA and this mysterious organization. Right. <laughs> I'm Mark Cohen, and thanks for watching Whistle Where You Work.